I was just waiting for somebody to come out of the bathroom and then we're uh, going to go. All of us. <laughs> if one can chase away a thousand, two. I think we're going to uh, get started. Shane, are you, is this on? Is it on, Shane? Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out to the Spurgeon Fellowship Classical Christian School Conference. We appreciate you guys being here. Uh, obviously, this is something near and dear to our fellowship's heart. Just to let you know, the Spurgeon Fellowship is a group of like-minded churches who gather to together once a month to discuss things that are going on in the church, outside the church, and how to change the culture that we're, we find ourselves in. Um, when I say like-minded, we hold to the doctrines of grace and the five solas. Okay, so we're, we're Calvinistically minded churches. Uh, we hold to the evangelical understanding of uh, faith alone and scripture alone. So we work together because we're like-minded to uh, combat the things that are going on in the uh, culture today. Um, as many of you know, Pastor Jensen was supposed to be speaking this morning. So he has, uh, he's in the hospital. We ask that you continue to pray for him. He had a, a lump on his neck and couldn't breathe. So they rushed him to the hospital, and he's, he's under very, very good care right now, and he seems to be recovering. So praise God for that. Just continue to keep him in prayer. Uh, I, he was asked to speak first because he was the headmaster of a classical Christian school that he helped start in Nassau County. And who better than to help us start a classical Christian school in Suffolk County than Pastor Jensen, who was a previous headmaster and has a background in education. He loves this. So <clears throat> we're praying for his uh, quick recovery and return. And when he does, he's on the committee with uh, Pastor Bruce Bennett to head up planting a classical Christian school here on Long Island. And before I go further, I would just like us to bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to today uh, to discuss the, the business of your church. Uh, we pray for your spirit and your wisdom as we navigate these waters. Uh, and it's our desire to glorify you by training up our children in the way they should go, by training them up in a Christian worldview with Christ as Lord. Father, we pray that you will bring the resources uh, monetarily, uh, person-wise, uh, mind-wise, Lord God, uh, church-wise, uh, to gather together to plant this church here uh, in Suffolk County. We want to glorify you. And Father, we do lift up Pastor Jensen to you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you are our great physician. You are our creator, our maker. So Father, we pray that you would raise him up out of that bed, that you would heal his body, that you would reduce the swelling in his neck, uh, that you would clear his airways, Lord, uh, <clears throat> restore strength to his body, that he would be able to walk walk out of that hospital in your power and sing praises to your name once again. Father, we pray that uh, the doctors and the nurses who we've had an opportunity to share the gospel with uh, would be pricked in their hearts and they would see the power of God and the power of his church 
uh, in this situation and it would move them to recognize Jesus as Lord, to repent of their sins and trust in you as Savior. So Lord, we pray that you would bless the rest of this time today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Okay, so real quickly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview of what the Spurgeon Fellowship uh, is doing. So, and then I'm going to show you a 20-minute video on classical Christian education, what exactly it is. Because rather than me explain it, who am not as familiar with it as uh, a Pastor Bruce or a Pastor Jensen, I found a real good video online that really codifies exactly what it is. So what I'm proposing, what I've proposed to the Spurgeon Fellowship already, and everybody has basically come on board with, is a plan. I call it the GPS. Okay, GPS is, you know, that little thing you turn on in your car when you don't know where you're going. And it helps you find your way and get to your destination. Well, this plan, I'm calling it GPS because I'm an acronym guy. All right, GPS, they stand for something. G stands for trade guilds. P stands for the political arena and pro-life arena. And S stands for schooling, classical Christian school. That's why we're here today. So trade guilds, why are those important? I just want to read uh, a quick definition of what a trade guild is. A trade guild is an association of craftsmen or merchants formed for mutual aid and protection and for the furtherance of their professional interests. Guilds flourished in Europe between the 11th and 16th centuries and formed an important part of the economic and social fabric of that era. Merchant guilds were associations of all or most of the merchants in a particular town or city. These men might be local or long-distance travelers, wholesale or retail sellers, and might deal in ca various categories of goods. Craft guilds, on the other hand, were occupational associations that usually comprised all of the artisans and craftsmen in a particular branch or industry of common commerce. So what my goal is, is, and the goal of the Spurgeon Fellowship, is to get all the Christian businessmen, the men who are in trades, the men who are in professional capacities, the men who are in uh, government, and start talking to the younger generation about what it is they want to do, how it is they want to earn a living, but more importantly, how they want to glorify God with their talents, gifts, and abilities. So the trade guild would serve two purposes. First, Let's say you're, um, you're a Christian insurance broker like myself. Somebody needs insurance. Hey, call Anthony. We're going to support ourselves from within. We know of a painter. Hey, my house needs painting inside, outside. Call this person. We want to support the people who are, who are brothers and sisters in Christ and who are part of the trade guild. Why? Well, that's going to help them earn a living and hire more people. Maybe some people from our congregations. Now, this is done in almost every other faith out there. You have Muslims that do this. You have Jews that do this. They have their own tight-knit community. And what we need to do as Christians is to build that tight-knit community. How much tighter should we be than anyone else when we have the bond of Christ and the Holy Spirit inside of us, right? So we want to support the men and women who have Christian businesses right now on Long Island and who are employing people. We want them to stay in business and we want them to grow their business. And with the way things are looking college-wise, some people are rethinking a secondary education. <clears throat> they might be better off putting their, their, their son uh, or daughter into an apprenticeship program where they can learn how to be a carpenter, learn how to be an electrician, learn how to be an insurance broker. You don't need a lot of schooling to become an insurance broker. Hence me, right? So you don't need you you don't need to you know have a, a an intellectual mind that's going to set the world on fire to sell insurance. You just need the desire to do it. So what we want to do is uh, work from within, work with the people who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, support them in their businesses, encourage them to do mentorships or apprenticeships programs. So this way, maybe maybe you have a, a, a son or a daughter who's looking to explore a particular industry. Well, you can call one of the men in the trade guild, have them give them a trial run. Maybe this is something they want to try to do and they do it for six months and say, you know what, this really isn't for me. What a better opportunity than to be able to try them within a Christian community. It's also going to teach uh, our children how to conduct business ethically, how to conduct business from a Christ-centered perspective. We're not here to bilk our 
our neighbors. We're here to help our neighbors. And the blessing of it is that we get paid to do it. Praise God. So that's the G in, in the, in the uh, acronym GPS. Now, for the trade guild to work, we need a committee of sound Christian men who own business, businesses to head this up. So if you know uh, a Christian businessman, please let him know that this is what we're trying to do. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you an email uh, and a place to find these videos and the video that I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes online. So everybody will have access to this information. We're going to need to create a directory of all these different businesses that are uh, owned by Christian brothers and sisters and support them. So if we create the directory and we circulate it around. Now, the Spurgeon Fellowship is, is comprised of churches in Nassau and Suffolk County. But predominantly for this conference, it's a Suffolk County thing because we're looking to plant a church in Suffolk County. It's difficult for them to come out here and try to support that when they have uh, a, a classical Christian school in Nassau County already. We're going to we're going to look to them for help and and guidance, uh, but predominantly this is Suffolk County. Um, we're going to need to hold periodic meetings to disseminate pertinent information. So what I ultimately would like is one or two representatives from each church to volunteer. We'll set up a committee. And we have Pastor Bruce and Pastor Jensen to head it up. But that committee would be able to uh, get the information out to the congregation and help lighten the load for the pastors who are doing this right now. Um, we need to walk in unity and conduct ourselves above reproach. And this would be a way to hold us accountable to that. Uh, we need to remember that Jesus is Lord and Long Island is Christ's island. So many people are looking to leave the island because they don't have a job. Well, if we had Christian businessmen and businesswomen who are willing to hire a Christian uh, brother or sister, well, maybe we can end that. And maybe we can turn the tide and just make a stand here on Long Island. I believe if we are faithful uh, in, in obeying the gospel and preaching the gospel and recognizing that Jesus is Lord, that we can turn this island right side up for, for the Lord. I, I see no reason why that can't happen. Twelve men changed the entire world. Why can't several uh, churches on Long Island turn the tide and and see a, a, a wave of reformation and revival here. The, uh, the last thing with regards to the um, trade guild is that this is not about money, but kingdom building and establishing a legacy. Okay, We want to build not with wood, hay, and stubble. We want to build with gold, silver, and precious jewels. And gold, silver, and precious jewels are all the things that are that are used to build the temple of God. Now, who is the temple of God? The church. So when you sow into somebody, okay, you sow good teaching into them, you sow good ethics into them, you sow good godly values in a biblical Christian worldview into that person, what are you doing? You're building with gold, silver, precious metals, precious stones. Okay, those are the things that are going to survive the test when we stand before God. Okay, so that's the trade guild. Next, political action. We need to pray for our politicians. We do that every week here from the pulpit and on Wednesday nights. We need to let the politicians know that we prayed for them. Think about what a witness that is to them, to know that a church prayed for them. And they get a letter the day after we pray telling them, this is what God expects of you as a leader. We know that leading people is not easy, um, but we're praying for you and we're here for you. What a blessing that is. We've heard from several of the politicians that we sent these letters to, how they, they appreciated it and, and, and want us to continue praying for them. So again, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you where you can find the form letter that we send out. You could tailor it to your particular church uh, and a list of the politicians in this local area. It may, may not be the same for those in Nassau County or further out east, uh, but you, you could see where we draw, uh, draw our uh, name and address list from create your own or use the one that we have, pray for your politicians and send them that letter. We also want to set up and educate and unite churches around what it means to be part of the government. Uh, Pastor Bruce and I had spoken about putting together a little video series on how to become a committeeman, okay? How to get involved in politics as a Christian, okay? It doesn't mean that we're looking toward the political arena to change the world. We're looking towards the gospel as the impetus to change the world, but we're going to serve the world and do it with a Christian worldview. Okay, this could be part of God's common grace. This could be a way that we can share the gospel with people in politics. Um, another thing we're going to do is set up breakfasts or lunch 
lunches and invite the local politicians in. We'll give them a 20 minute sermonette, so to speak, uh, give them uh, a chance to ask questions of us and us of them, and then to, to have fellowship over a meal and talk about what the issues are that they're voting on and what the Bible says about those issues. So we need to pray for our politicians. We need to welcome them in. We need to minister to them. Um, and then we need to vote biblically. Okay. And that would be part of the political arena. Okay. So that's part of the piece. So we got trade guilds and the political arena. Next is the pro-life ministry. We need to make a concerted effort to outlaw abortion and educate our congregations on how to stand for the unborn and the pro and the pro-life position. Again, how can God bless America when we're slaughtering a million babies a year happily? I don't think most of the population of the United States supports abortion, but that's not enough. It's not enough to not support it. You have to support and fight for the pro-life position. Otherwise, they're going to take they're going to gain ground. The people who are pro-death are going to continue to put forth their agenda, and right now they're winning. One life is too many. What kind of people are we if we're not standing up for the unborn and in the face of them saying this is okay, it's a woman's choice? No, it's not. This is not God's plan for babies. This is not God's plan for men and women who are having children. So, again, we want to set up a committee and we kind of have like a little ad hoc committee right now. But if this is something that you want to be a part of, please I'm going to get again, I'm going to leave an email at the end of the presentation. You can send me an email. We'll start putting together a list of people for these different committees. We want to pray weekly uh, for the unborn and the pro-life organizations that are helping us, uh, such as Soundview Pregnancy Center and Love Life. Um, we want to preach and teach the biblical position on human life and murder. We believe this is something that you can preach and teach from the pulpit. I mean, this is something that should be advocated, uh, the pro-life position. We want to make our presence known in front of abortion clinics. Uh, from what I understand, the statistics are 75% of the people who are coming there for an abortion, when they see a large crowd of people, they end up driving away. Our presence, just our presence standing there, whether you're holding a sign or not, can save a life, can cause somebody to drive right by and, and not pull in. This is important, and we see the fruit of it in our congregation. Praise God. We thank God for Jake and Emily. They were the ones who uh, witnessed and, and ministered to a couple who were coming in for an abortion. They turned around, left. Jake and Emily got their information. We we're in contact with them. They decided to have the baby. Thankfully, Pastor Chris and his wife graciously uh, offered to foster care this child, and now we see a baby, a beautiful baby in our congregation because of the efforts of the pro-life ministry. If that doesn't motivate you to be part of the pro-life ministry, I don't know what will. What else do we have to do? We're seeing life. This is God-ordained uh, life that's coming into this world that we're nurturing and bringing forth. And Maybe one day we'll become a believer and bear witness to the fact that my life was saved because someone was standing in front of an abortion mill. Okay, so that's the P. We have political action and pro the pro-life ministry. And finally now we're going to get to the C which is why we're here this morning, schooling. We need to break the government-run school systems and set up our own. I heard Gary DeMar recently, uh, this is a quote of his, he says, in the 1940s, the literacy rate of whites was 96%, and the literacy rates for blacks was 86%. Now, after trillions of dollars, the literacy rate is less among whites and less among blacks. He didn't say what it was, but I'm assuming it's somewhere between 60 and 70%. Worse, any mention of God is prohibited in school, and Marxist, socialist, and communistic ideologies are being promoted. This is disastrous because they are indoctrinating our children into a Marxist worldview. This is antithetical to the Christian worldview. This is, flies right in the face of what we stand for. Now, we were um, blessed. We have this movie called Indoctrination by Colin Gunn, and we're willing to come to your church and show. We had the opportunity to go to Pastor Chris's church, Calvary Baptist, show the movie, uh, and then answer questions at the end. And when you watch this movie and you see it r right in your face, what they're teaching in these schools, you will be alarmed. You will be frightened. 
hopefully you'll be motivated to do something about it. So if your church wants that movie shown, we're happy to come uh, in a Sunday afternoon service, obviously not for a worship service, but Sunday afternoon, Saturday, Friday night, whatever you, you tell us when you want to come and we will be there to show the movie and answer questions. This is very, very important. It's unacceptable for our children. They must be completely removed from the public school system. You know, we complain uh, that our kids walk away from church while we allow Caesar to indoctrinate them for eight hours a day for 16 years of the, their lives and then wonder, oh, I don't know what happened. You don't know what happened. You sent your kids out for eight hours a day. They come home. They have a completely different understanding of the world than you do. And we don't have enough time in the, in the, in the, the dinner period, the dinner time when you're sitting around the table to undo everything that they've, they've let seep in. And all the friends and, and the peer pressure that goes along with that. That's why we want to start a classical Christian school and baptize them, immerse them in a Christian worldview and teach them biblical godly values. OK, the, we're hoping that the churches are going to support this. We're even looking to do like a quasi homeschool slash Christian school, where if you're a homeschooler and you know that the school is teaching a, a certain class that you need help in, you can send your son or daughter to the school just for that class. What a benefit that would be to moms and dads who are homeschooling. We don't want to eliminate homeschooling. We want to promote that. But some people are just not able to do homeschooling. So we want to give them a solid classical Christian alternative. Okay, so for the classical Christian school, again, we need to set up a committee committee to organize, educate, and unite the churches. If this is something that you think is in your wheelhouse, please volunteer. Again, we'll have the email up at the end. We want to encourage homeschooling, Christian schooling, and private schooling. We want to show the indoctrination movie to the congregation. So please let us know if you want us to do that. And we want to, we're willing to hold additional conferences and provide any information that we have on the schooling process to you. So that's our goal. With that, I'm done talking. Good for you. Um, and I'm about to put up the video uh, that tells you exactly what classical Chris Christian schooling is. It's based on the trivium. Again, this is going to explain it much better than I can. Thank you for your attention. And here we go. <laughs> I'm going to make a very bold statement. I believe classical Christian education is the best possible education to help every child reach their God-given potential. Classical Christian education takes advantage of a child's God-given development using age-specific learning in kindergarten through 12th grade. It is time-tested in method and content, Christ-centered, academically rigorous, fun, and nurturing. In the next 20 minutes, we hope to convince you to look further into this educational model for your children, that we might together see a new generation lead and engage our culture to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do Homer, Latin, and the Trojan War have to do with cloud computing, genetic engineering, and robotics? Or pastors, parents, and politicians for that matter? More than you might imagine. Come join us as we discover classical Christian education, a new old way to raise a generation of leaders and followers who have the depth and wisdom to live and work effectively for God's kingdom. One of the remarkable things about Christendom is that there has always been a, a connecting of revival and renewal with substantive classical Christian education. Uh, it's no mistake whatsoever that when Charlemagne began to imagine at the beginning of the ninth century, 
a, a future for the Frankish kingdom, and even the development of something like a Holy Roman Empire. He, he knew that in order for that vision to be sustainable, uh, there would have to be centers of learning. And so this illiterate Frankish warlord established what, what would become the, the uh, foundations of Christian universities, called scholastic institutions. As we move forward uh, into the Reformation, time after time after time, what we see is the establishment of schools, uh, the establishment of, uh, of classical curricula, uh, the establishment of centers of learning. Every single time, there has been a great renewal, a, a wondrous flowering of art and music and literature and ideas. It has been either preceded or accompanied by a new emphasis on the education and discipleship of the coming generations. Hi, I'm Marlon Detweiler. I have four sons. We were challenged to consider the idea of classical Christian education when our oldest son was in first grade. At that time, R.C. Sproul recommended we read a book called Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning. In it, we learned about this wonderful idea that was always there in the back of our mind about how education could be better. And when we saw it, we said, that's what we want for our kids. I belong to the conservative book club, and they featured one month uh, a book called The Turning Point by uh, Marvin Olasky and Her Herbert Schlossberg. Uh, and I'd read Schlossberg's Idols for Destruction, which is a great book. And it was very clear that this Turning Point book was the first in a series of biblical worldview books. I thought, I'm, I would love to write the book on education. They were going to be applying scriptural biblical worldview principles to everything, literature and movies and uh, foreign policy and so on. And I wanted to do the one on education. So I, I called up the editor of the series, Marvin Olasky, and uh, he was kind enough to talk to me. And I was going to Florida for a conference and arranged to stop in Austin, where Marvin lived, on the way back. And, and we talked and talked about the possibility of me doing the project. He wound up coming up to Idaho to see Logos School. Logos School had been in operation about 10 years at that point. And after they visited, um, I was given the contract to write that book. So basically, that's, that's the long and short of it. We had um, built the school on Dorothy Sayers' principles, and uh, when I had the opportunity to write the book, we were uh, enabled to tell the story. So what do we mean by the term classical Christian education? Are we calling for a revival of togas and gladiators? Not exactly. Classical Christian education is an approach to learning based on a teaching model known as the trivium, which consists of three parts grammar, logic, and rhetoric. For now, before we define these terms, we need to know that classical Christian education is an educational approach that relies on teaching children the way God has made everyone to learn. It strives to fully integrate a Christian worldview into all subjects and in a way that works with a child's natural development. Our founding fathers would have thought such an approach rather ordinary, but today it sounds alien. How did we get to this point? It began with Horace Mann. Horace Mann was, uh, when you go back to look at the, the beginning of the um, 19th century, uh, you begin to, there's a transition that takes place in the control of education. Uh, in the colonial period, you had mandated education. The, 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 the fathers of that particular period said, look, we need to have the young people go to school. This needs to be mandated education, compulsory education. And so the people of Massachusetts were pretty much in tune with compulsory education, but it was at the local level. And at the same time that this was at the local level, you also found that it was particularly Christian education. So you had local control, Christian education, but governed by the civil sphere. And it was through man and through the governor of that particular uh, time that saw the way to, to transform that particular culture was to control education, make it monolithic, take it out of the hands of the, the, the local communities and put it in the hands of the state. And they started a board of education 
where Horace Mann was the Secretary of Education. Another person important in our understanding of the history of education in America was John Dewey. He came to prominence in the late 19th century and is credited with being the founder of pragmatism, the only school of philosophy birthed in America. He recognized that the individual student was key in education, but with the emphasis being on making them a good citizen, and education became more geared toward getting a job rather than learning for its own sake. John Dewey comes along 1859, which is rather interesting because it's the same year that Darwin's On the Origin of Species is published. And of course, uh, Dewey didn't have anything to do with that then, but later on, of course, Darwinism becomes very impactful when it comes to public education. He liked everything about Christianity, very much like Horace Mann liked everything about Christianity, except the idea that there is a sovereign God and we are sinners. And he believed, like Horace Mann, if you give more power to the state, you let the state develop the curriculum, get rid of any uh, 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 sectarian bias in all of this, that you can create a new community. In fact, this is a phrase that occurs over and over and over again in Dewey's writings, this idea of a new community, a, a democracy of education, uh, putting power in the, in, in the hands of the state in order to create this unified new community, which he actually called a new faith. Uh, unfortunately, however, of course, the, the schools became more and more secular as Christianity began to be driven out, mostly because of Darwin. Darwin comes along in 1859. Pretty soon the curriculum is Darwinian from, from top to bottom. Uh, there are remnants of Christianity within the curriculum, 62, 63. Those are eliminated, the prayer and Bible reading being taken out. And today what you find is, is a purely secular institution, which you know, all the way back to Governor Morton when, when Horace Mann came on the scene and wanted to go back to the to the old way of doing things, uh, he saw it. Uh, and, and what's also interesting about all this, when you go outside of Massachusetts and outside of Connecticut, the, the, the private school, the church schools, the uh, individual tutors and so forth were doing quite well. I mean, you know, think about it. Drafting the Declaration of Independence, drafting the Constitution, the starting of our nation was not done through the public school system. It was done through a free enterprise uh, educational system uh, that created, you know, the, the, the greatest nation uh, on earth. So now let's jump ahead to the 1940s in Oxford, England, where we learn of Dorothy Sayers, a contemporary of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. There she delivered an essay called The Lost Tools of Learning in which she lamented what had happened to education and how education had fallen. We learn from her of what education had been like during a potentially more grand time, the medieval period, where classical education was understood to be the norm. Dorothy Sayers wrote, uh, delivered an address or wrote this essay sometime in the 40s on the lost tools of learning. In which, and that essay encapsulated what I call the, the Sayers insight, where she she took um, the stages of child development and applied them to the medieval trivium, and came up with this um, uh, marvelous synthesis. I think a marvelous insight, saying, "Why don't we teach the trivium in a way that lines up with um, the natural stages that children go through?" Um, many people make the mistake of thinking that Dorothy Sayers was talking about how they actually educated in 1312 or something, but she wasn't doing that. She she was taking the medieval trivium that was all the that contained all these subjects, including grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric, and then a subsequent education reformer, a guy named John Amos uh, Comenius, came up with the idea in the 1600s of prerequisites, you know, before you take this class, you ought to take this class. And, and he, he was the one who developed the idea of stages, education methodically laid out in stages. And so what, what happened in Dorothy Sayers, Comenius meets the trivium, the medieval trivium. And she uh, wrote this essay in which she said, uh, children grow through a Paul Parrot stage, they go through a Pert stage, and they go through a poetic stage. And those correspond nicely to grammar, dialectic, and and rhetoric. So she did this uh, essay in the 40s, and I was um, I subscribed to a magazine called National Review, 
And when I was in the Navy and single, I, I remember getting this, the copy of the magazine, a National Review would periodically reprint Dorothy Sayers' essay as an article. And I read it and was interested in it. Oh, that's that's fun. And, um, and then just forgot about it until a few years later when I was out of the Navy, married, and we were in the process of starting a school. We, we needed something to organize the school around. And I remembered having read that essay uh, in National Review. So we went back and looked it up and hauled it out again, reread it, and thought, oh, this, yeah, this could work. Here we see a fundamental difference between what education was and now is. We want to recover a way of learning with the ultimate goal of producing free thinking citizens, not simply preparing young folks for a job. The trivium or threefold way, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, are the foundation of classical Christian education method. The grammar stage, the stage of mastering lots of information, coincides with a child's willingness to memorize lots of information, make it fun, make it interesting, and they'll learn most anything. Why not make it meaningful things? Learning history facts, math facts, mastering language. It's one of the reasons why Latin becomes the paradigm discipline of the grammar stage. The logic stage is a stage that students move into in the seventh grade range. We, we coincide with the junior high years as we think about it. It's at that time that they become pert or maybe argumentative. During that stage, we wanna teach them to argue well. We're teaching with the grain when we do that. They want to argue, let's teach them to do it well. We teach them logic, the art of thinking, in order to do that. We also teach how and why in history. And it becomes a time where the student really learns how to relate things in the past or things in one area to things in another. The final stage, the rhetoric stage, is the capstone of a classical Christian education in a K-12 world. In it, we're addressing the students changing nature to being concerned about how they come across. They wanna be articulate and persuasive. They want to be thought well of. And so we teach them how to communicate in such a way that they're believable and their arguments are embraced easily by people that are listening to them. We want them to be able to be effective in their communication. And no one needs to tell us how important that is in the world in which we live. Classical Christian education is a new old way, a newly recovered old approach to learning that has had great past success and strong results today. We wanna make things better today and tomorrow. Classical education is not an exercise in nostalgia. It's an investment in the future with great present day rewards. It also sends down deep roots to support big dreams. George Grant tells a great story that perfectly illustrates what we mean. One of the most magnificent halls in all of Oxford, England, is at uh, what is called New College or St. Mary's College. It's a college from the 14th century. and. You walk into their dining hall or their commons hall, and it is absolutely magnificent with uh, this beautiful medieval woodwork and soaring ceiling with these vast oak beams. And uh, But the story behind those oak beams is really one of the most remarkable stories of foresight and planning that I've ever heard. In the 14th century, the building was built and the beams were carved. But by the 1950s, it was evident that dry rot had begun to set in. And so the college trustees began to cast about to find a way to replace the beams. So they put out to lumber contractors all throughout Great Britain first, and, and then later to the continent of Europe. But beams of sufficient quality and size could not be found. So they began to put out bids all across the world, uh, throughout Asia and the Americas. And still, no beams of sufficient quality or quantity could be secured. And so the trustees began to consider the um, inconceivable, and that was that they would have to go to some sort of a laminated beam. But it was at about that time that, according to some stories, a janitor or uh, still other stories, a, a student intern, came across the old plans for the college. 
But when the the scroll was unrolled and the parchment was examined, uh, what the trustees discovered was an astonishing plan. Back in the 14th century, the designers of this beautiful, beautiful college knew that one day the beams would have to be replaced. And so they had had the foresight to prepare for that eventuality. Oak trees had been planted along the edge of the college. The story is told that uh, when the trustees were meeting, they had the parchment spread out. And as it was being explained to them, they, they simply lifted their eyes to the window and looked out at this vast array of magnificent oak trees. The designers of that college had planned 500 years ahead. We who have difficulty planning even five years ahead have a very hard time imagining how you could think that far ahead. But the reality is, is that they weren't just thinking about the beams. They had thought through the plantings and the gardens of the entire college. They believed in planning for the future, laying strong foundations and, and, and creating the resources necessary for generations ahead. That kind of vision is unique to a Christian worldview. Alas, it's the kind of vision that uh, has largely been lost in modern Christendom, but it's a vision that, uh, that I trust we can begin to recover, which is precisely why classical Christian education is so vital. It, it really is the planting of oak trees long, long before they are needed. It's, it's recognizing in the acorns of uh, this moment's opportunity, the future beams to support the glories of the unfolding of Christian civilization. Thank you for spending time with us, reflecting on the history and promise of classical Christian education. I hope that you will see its great potential in raising a new generation of faithful, intelligent followers of Christ. We need not despair amidst the smoldering ruins of our current educational system. Rising from those ashes is a new, old way to educate our children. Classical education draws on the riches of Western civilization and weaves together the hearts and minds of our children to the glory of God. It builds on their natural strengths as they develop, equipping them to achieve whatever they are led to do. I hope you'll consider classical education. Imagine what the world might look like if our children are raised to think Christianly about art, family, politics, literature, and history, business, and science. But don't stop there. Imagine what the world will look like if this continued to include your great-grandchildren. May the Lord find us faithful to live out our calling as we consider this new old way. I think they said it well better than <laughs> I could anyway. Um, I told you I was gonna leave you this uh, up here. Uh, this is the email in the event you or someone you know uh, wants to volunteer for a committee, become a teacher, somehow or another be involved in this whole process, please have them send information to the email. I'll look through it and try to call it out. Uh, and then if you wanna rewatch this video um, or learn more about the GPS, plan. I have all that up there. You could download it. I have the sample letter that we send out to our politicians. I also have the list of politicians that we send the letter out to. So it can all be found there. Just want to read you one quick scripture. 
He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. We are planting trees. Throughout the scripture, people, men, women are likened to trees. So if we plant a classical Christian school here on Long Island, we are planning for a future generation. Uh, my goal is to see Long Island turned right side up because we know Long Island is Christ. With that, um, I don't think we, I mean, if you need a break, you can take a break. There's uh, bathrooms out in the foyer. I don't have to tell you to turn one of these little things off. Um, with that, we'll probably move right into the second session and then we'll take a 10 minute break between that one and the next one. So what I'd like to do now is introduce our next speaker, Pastor Bruce Bennett. Uh, he's been a pastor for 16 years on Long Island at Word of True Church, recently bought a brand new building. I'm sorry.